Hey, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Dice Tower. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Mike Delicio. I'm Z Garcia. Today, coming at you from the past, from the ancient, ancient past, we we push back the brush. Yeah, that's great. Of yesteryear. Let me get out my papyrus. <laughs> <laughs> so, quick shout out to people in chat. Has anyone here? Was 2013 the year you got into gaming? Oh, it's a, okay, that's it a good question. It was not. It for wasn't us. for us. Yeah. Um, right. And in fact. I was very well trenched in at this point. I started mm -hmm. writing reviews 20 years ago, so this is, I guess, the halfway point. Mm -hmm. Not really, because I played games my whole life, but definitely in 2013, I thought of myself as a seasoned gamer. Yeah. Now I look yeah. back and I'm like, 2013 time was a moron. Well, you were so young, so yes. innocent. I was, I was 36. A naive waif. A nice, a nice age to be. You were 13. Okay. I was 13 years old. We're yeah. not going to get into how old I was. My kids yeah. were. My Melody was 13. Somebody's going to believe you that I was 13. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I like doing this stuff every once in a while. We used to do it on our podcast where we go back and look at stuff from 10 years ago. And in fact, I forgot to do this. Maybe I'll sneak and look during the top 10. I forgot to look at what my top 10 of 2013 was in 2013. In 2013, oh, wow. I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't you have keeping, that data. You should. You should find that. I don't think I was keeping track of it back then. At least not. To I that wasn't level. a huge nerd yet. Mm -hmm. well, I was Mike, a nerd. That's what Mike is saying. Well, Tom, you were a huge nerd ten years ago. Oh, a couple people. Yeah. Said 2013 was when they got into the hobby. All right. Good awesome. for Frank and for and for David and for I'm not Chrissy. I do like that flex. Somebody just said in 2013 I was working on Broadway. Yeah, right? Like, all right, all right. Mm -hmm. All right, humble brag. That's I got back you. when I was in the movies. I'm sorry, I was uh, on the space shuttle. They call it the talking I, pictures back the talkies. <laughs> I was doing the talkies, yeah. See? So this is not going to be a list. I, I, this was really... Sometimes we struggle with our list. Right. No struggling here. I yeah. went through it. was like, yes, 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 yes. In fact... Several of these are in my top 100. Well, I was, was going to ask. Year. I was going to ask you that. I, I believe that for me, two of these games are in my top 100. Uh, four for me. Okay. Yeah, about four. I don't know. I forgot it already, but about four. Mm. So that's going to make the, the second half of our top ten very mundane and boring if you watch our top 100. But we're going to do it because if you haven't been keeping an eye on Dice Tower Affairs, this entire studio has no AC. <laughs> Except for this room. Except for this room we're in right now. So we're going to stretch this out. Let's just sit here and think about that for Let a moment. Let me tell you a story. Let me paint Talk a picture for you folks. Close your eyes. Let's get it. Breathe deeply in through your nose. Hold it. You trying to make people suffocate? And a deep cleansing breath out. <laughs> all right, all right. I oh, just, I, this, I just I'm don't. I'm, I'm down. <laughs> don't turn off. Let's get started. Here we go. Number ten. Number ten. All right. So for my number ten, uh, I have a game that I remember at the time. Oh, slow down. Uh, I remember <laughs> at the time. I already, I already get enough grief for taking too do. long of a preamble do, before I do. get to the game. So shut up, all of you. Nations. My number 10 is Nations. But I do remember that back... And don't shut up. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kidding. Back when it was released... <laughs> okay, I found my top 10. No one no cares. One cares. Go ahead, come on. You that, told me you cared. That's so 2013, Mike is speaking, okay? List. Sorry. The adults are speaking. That list is so 2013. It's your number 10 nations. It is. And I remember when it came out, there was a bit of a controversy over, this is not really a civilization game. This is a Euro game, right? And it's so funny that that argument comes up over and over and over again. This is one of those categories, genres, civ games that I think has a unnecessarily narrow definition for some people. Mm -hmm. If you want to be pedantic about it, it is a civilization themed game. Mm -hmm. It does not have many of the tropes of what are considered to be a classic civ game. Same thing can be said for tapestry, same thing can be said for mosaic, whatever the case may be. I like this game because it has many of the things that you look for in civ type games and I think it does it in a bit more of a streamlined way, much more abstract, especially the warfare is a very abstracted, uh, you know, form of how mm. you would handle com combat or conflict in a game like this. Um, but it did it more quickly. You know, I was, you know, expecting uh, you know, through the ages and I got something very different. You know, much sure, shorter, right, much right. more streamlined, much more Euro, although through the ages pretty Euro too. Uh, but that's my number 10, Nations. I'd like to offer a rebuttal. Sure, go. Uh, I don't care about the whether it's a Civ game or not. This game's too long. Too long? How many people are you playing it with? It's too long at two. No, it's not. How about at one? It's 
darn good at one. It's not too long at two. Also, this is just not as good as Through the Ages for one. But you're complaining about the length and you're talking about Through the Ages? Oh, well, yeah, but I mean. Oh, oh, point to Mike, okay? <laughs> Go ahead. I'll take half the time and three quarters as good. How about that? It's not three quarters as good. Sure. It is. And then the other Maybe killer not. that came in was Nations the Dice Game, which is. A sure. lot of the same stuff in a really fast, smooth, streamlined game. No, I like Nations of Dice game, too, but it didn't come out in 2013. I know. When did it come out, Mike? Probably 20. How many 16? games did you play in 2013? Let's do top 10 2016 games. 15 or 16. I think, was, I think it was a couple years. Nations the Dice There game. you go. It's not. No, why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> Stop it. You've been um, lying a lot today. That's what I do. Uh... I agree. I've never played Nations, actually, but Nations, the dice game, is a good one. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the first ones that did that whole something, the dice game. Yeah. Like, the wave was just cresting That's right true. there. It was starting to come up. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, wait, so-and-so, the dice game. Whatever, whatever, the card game. Oh, boy, here we go, you know? Which was the first one? I, Raw is one of the earliest ones I can think of. But San like Juan if you, certainly San, is one of the earlier was a, ones. But that's Catan not a dice game. Is pretty but it was called dice. Puerto Rico, the card game, in some places okay. in the world. Catan? Werfel, the, the Werfel Bonanza one. The dice game? It's yeah. not that old, is it? No. I don't know. Colorado had a dice game, right? Mm. Colorado did not have a dice really? game. Really? I thought it was... The, there was Colorado, and there was Colorado or whatever. The Humber had a one. bad dice game. It was terrible. Yeah. Yahtzee, the dice game. There you go. All right. Monopoly, actually. <laughs> yeah, probably, right? <laughs> My number 10 <laughs> is a card game. I thought you were about to say it's a crossover. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. My number 10 is a... There will be some crossovers here, I suspect, by the probably, way. Probably, yeah. Yeah. I don't think... I think I'm going to almost not cross over with you at all. I disagree. Maybe. I think we're going to cross over on two of these. Oh, okay. That's what I was going to say, too. But that's not mm. as much as it might be. Okay. So my number 10 is a card game. And I've said in the past that I really like cards with powers. Mm. That's one of my favorite you have said that. types of games. If there are cards that represent people or characters or events, whatever, with powers, I love that. This one is one of those, and it's it's... A fairly little-known game, I would say. This is a game called Kashgar Merchants mm. of the Silk Road. I didn't play this till like two years ago. Yeah, I played this maybe five years ago. I definitely did not play when it came out, I think. And in it, you are building columns of characters that you are acquiring. You put the character, the new character goes, I believe, at the back of a column. And mm. on your turn, you trigger the front of a column. That character will do something for you. You are managing your resources. You trigger the character, it does whatever it does, and then you put it at the back of the column mm. so that you won't see that same power and ability for a while. You can make these columns as long as you want to or as short as you want to. Sometimes you want both. Yeah. You want a lot of abilities, but sometimes you want to be able to come back to something that you want to repeat often. Yeah, I love having a quick row of a mm. column two. You're like it's like a flip. quick, simple turn, <laughs> but a row column version of that. Mm. Uh huh? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you got it. Mm. Uh, this is a really fun game. I like it a lot. Now, mechanically, it's clever. Thematically, it's incredibly dry, dry in Euro. It's like, what are you doing in it? You're buying things with sacks of other things <laughs> and, and donkeys. <laughs> Those are your resources. It also doesn't look good. It, it doesn't does look very terrible. good. The theme is really, really dry, but uh, the gears turning within it are really engaging and fun. So, Is, is that the original, that Grail Games edition? No. Uh, no? No. Okay. It's a German publisher was the okay. OG one. It didn't come out in English until a few years ago. Got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So, so you, you had one of those hipster... He did. No. You didn't have one of the ones that with the... The pay stubs yeah. and stuff? No, no, oh, no, okay, no. I, can't, right. I got this when it came out in English. I got you, but it, but it was a 2013 release. Yeah, Fair enough. So, yep. Yeah, that's mine. All right, my number four... My number ten, sorry. My number ten was four. number four. So okay. it dropped down like a bit. Originally in 2013. Yeah. Okay. This game um, is the worst component dump I've ever done. Where I used to drop all the pieces. Yeah. This one was the hardest one ever to clean up, and that is BattleCon Devastation. Oof. All right, so I like BattleCon. I think that's a fun system. I think you've played it. I think I played with you, Devastation Vindines. Yeah, I think so. You all love when nine games more, look alike. Sorry, yeah, they, they, they all they look do. alike. To me. Oh my gosh. So in this so game, you, it, it's a it's a 
Street Fighter type game where you have two characters and they're on that little line there just going back and forth fighting each other. Mm -hmm. And each round of the game, you play two cards. You have these basic cards that almost everybody has, and then you have the special cards for your character. You play two, then you cannot do those two cards again until you play some other cards. Okay. Um, but the cards, there's so many different combinations of cards you can play, and every character is very, very different. Mm. I like it. It is a bear to not, not necessarily teach. It's not overly difficult to teach, but there's a lot going on. Like, okay. pick a character. Oh, uh, no, not that character. They're too that complicated. character's too complicated. Okay, that character is good. All right, now here's what, it, oh, we, this combo happened, this is what happens. There's a lot of that in it. Once you do it, I think it's one of the deepest, most involved. Hmm. The reason why such a bad component drop is that I got the game and there was tons of extra, I think this was a, you know, this was a Kickstarter, tons of extra Kickstarter stuff and it wasn't labeled as which character it was. Mm. And I didn't think about that. I dumped it all. Oh and then they had like anime versions of the characters and I'm looking at them to see if it's the same person. Oh my god! It gosh. took like three hours to sort out. Oof. But um, That would terrible. be an interesting list. Top 10 worst component dumps. Games that would be right. the worst if you component dumps. Them. Yeah, and it's, I'm not necessarily blaming them. It wasn't their fault that I was a moron like that. Um, <laughs> I'm... It taught me a valuable lesson mm. to always check. Like I, I the second worst jump was one of the legendaries. Yeah, oh. sounds like what I'm thinking of. <laughs> yeah. Legendary encounters. Well, those you can sort out by the bottom of the card if you're wearing jeweler's glasses. Yeah, yeah, those, yeah. The, the loop. But anyway, it's a really fun fighting game. It's it's faded for me a bit. That's, that's why it's down to ten. But it's still very very good. Number nine. <laughs> My number nine is a very, um, I remember that the, at the time that I played it, thinking that this was what, like, the pinnacle of deluxe games. Nowadays, it would be thought of as a relatively standard Euro production, uh, but at the time, it was a big, grandiose production. Um, and it's a game that I think is a, a bit underappreciated. I don't see anybody talking about this game or playing it anymore. And my number nine is Francis Drake. Um, oh yeah, that's true. I really enjoy this game. It's a kind of a two-phase game where the first phase of the game uses what type of system, Tom? Ratchet. If okay, you, if you don't want me to use ratchet, give me a better word. A one-way one street. I don't like the. Oh, that kind of works. Yeah. So the idea is along the top there, along the top of the board, you can see those are different action spots, and you can go as far along as you want to, but you cannot go <laughs> backward, and. Uh, you're leaving behind something juicy every time you skip something because you want to do every one of these things. Some of them are giving you resources. Some of them are, are giving you some benefits for the second half of the of the round. Um, and also, there's you you a lot of times want to be the first one to to sail. And so, if you're the first one to go to the to the dock, you could be the first one to sail out. And then you are in the second half of each round, placing face down these discs that are going to kind of give you uh, the order of when things are happening, mm -hmm. okay? And so I like games that have distinct phases like that, where both phases are compelling. This is an example of that. I think both phases are compelling in, in Francis Drake. Um, it is, you know, again, for the time especially, a beautiful, beautiful production. It's a bit, the box is unwieldy and big, and it's not something that's easy to take to game night, so maybe that hurts it. Um, I think I think that Kayao games, this this was one of two games that came out with that this year. The other was the Dinosaur game. Um, I forget what it was called, but it had a bunch know. of dinosaurs all over the board. It was a really cool yeah, game. Yeah. Um, this designer kind of dropped off the planet. The last game he did was actually a Dice Diary Essentials. He did the, the um, Royals, right? Royals. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a it's a really solid Euro game. Um, mm. and, and and again, I don't know why it's kind of just fallen out of the discussion completely. But I still okay. enjoy it. Francis Drake, my number nine. My number nine is uh, very well known, as opposed to my number ten, that again was was not really in the conversation much. Number nine definitely was. It was a very attractive, very inexpensive game for what you got. That is Forbidden Desert. Mm. Forbidden Ten Desert. Years? Uh, I am old. Oh, I know. Oh I know. man. So Forbidden Island came out. Uh, it came out after Pandemics from the same designer, and it was a hit. It was a game that managed to take what Pandemic had done to a certain degree, make it smaller, make it more accessible, make it prettier, mm -hmm. you know, and have it be again very inexpensive. It was from Game Right, so. You had this lovely production. Uh, it could, you know, welcome families. It could welcome new gamers, gamers, and so they had a follow-up, which I thought was a much better game. Actually, 
Because to me, Forbidden Island, while great and I do enjoy it, always felt like Pandemic Light. It did. It was like, okay, Pandemic was a hit. Let me design something else, very similar, and put it out as an alternate edition for a different group of folks, right. perhaps. Different theme, different... Yeah. yeah, yeah. Forbidden Desert felt like a new game to me. Mm -hmm. Fully new. Yeah, you still have characters. It's still cooperative. You are still trying to achieve whatever together. But the movement of the sandstorm, this really cool idea that I remember everybody who read about this before the game came out thought, ooh, this is amazing, was this idea of where are the parts to the ship that right. you are putting together? Well, you discover that when you flip over two tiles that tell you basically the longitude and latitude of where this thing mm -hmm. is. And where those two things cross, there is what you're looking for. And it was such a neat idea. It is. It's so cool that... That's how you populate and, and discover the board. So Forbidden Desert still really, really holds up for me. I think Island is fine, a little light, a little repetitive, but Desert, fantastic. I love this Still game. the best of that series. I agree. Yeah. We'll have to find Until out what Forbidden uh, the Jungle new one is. comes out. Yeah. I heard Forbidden Jungle blows Desert away. It you heard it here first. Over desert or All right. no. I don't know. My number nine is a crossover. A direct crossover with Mr. Mike Delisio. Really? I like Francis Drake. I didn't know you liked this game that much. Cool. I mm. really like this. I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's At good. At one point, I think it was in my top 100. Okay. Um, very solid game. Everything Mike said is, is correct. My only caveat, the thing that keeps me from wanting to play all the time, is that first half of the game, I think, is particularly better than this, or the first half of each round is more fun than the second half. You like that better than that the... That ratchet thing's fun. Going out and fighting stuff's street. interesting. Well, cross over with me next time if you want me to say your words. <laughs> um, I like the the, the, the the getting into the heads. That's the favorite part of the second half. Although I agree, I think the first part is a little right. better, but they're, they're both good. They are, and you're right. The box is a little bigger than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. it, if, if, if I pulled this out, though, you were talking about component quality, and I didn't tell you who it was from, you might think it was a queen game. You would, might it think really looks a like a queen one. or even one of the eagle, the, the nicer One of the one. early eagle yeah, griffins. Yeah. And I think that's because he worked with them ah. and talked to those companies as he put this together. He self-published this and the dinosaur game, for Got which it. for some reason I can't remember the name of. Um, and I really like this. If this hadn't sold so many, I would have tried to get this for Dice ah. Essential. But yeah, yeah. yeah, Francis Drake, very, very good game. Hmm. Remember how we said there weren't going to be a lot of crossovers? And that, you did uh, Francis Drake again? I did. No. My number eight is a crossover with Z Garcia. I, I think everything he said, one. just one step higher. Uh, Forbidden Desert. Yeah, it's a fantastic game. Uh, we're, we, we've talked Guys, about this supposed a to be bit. a slower list. I know, right? <laughs> um, so here's, I guess here's my little thing that I would add to, to what you had said is that, no, because I agree with everything you said, but... but. Forbidden it's Desert, simple. I think, showed that the system is a little bit more versatile because, like you said, Forbidden Island felt like pandemic light. Mm -hmm. This used those same kind of things, but it showed that it could be much more dynamic because this is a more dynamic game, right? You've got mm -hmm. the, the moving of the sand, like you said, the, the different way you're, you're discovering stuff. Um, and it didn't quite have that... Um, I don't know how to put it other this than... This so interesting. My number eight is Forbidden Desert. No, 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 no. I'm not being sarcastic. I mean... Yes, you are. No, I wasn't really convinced when he talked about it, but what you said, it made it so uh, He's more picking on me than you, is believe. Ah, I see. Yeah, I he's see. using you to pick on me. Mm, That's correct. I'm a pro so this is, I'm a war by proxy, right? Kind of, yeah. Here we got the two great superpowers. I'm some little island somewhere that's being fought over. Thanks. Why are you making this about you? <laughs> I was yeah, attacked it was because it's my number! <laughs> I love how you just call us both uh, great superpowers, i.e. Right. fatty, <laughs> I, over I, the little I, island we're fighting. Okay, Japan Mike, was I a superpower, it. and that's a very svelte country. Yeah, My number yeah. eight is Forbidden Desert. I don't think Z said. Calls Japan a svelte country. Why, why not? They're Who's a svelte country? In Japan. They're very svelte. I don't think I've heard the word svelte this many times in the They're very session. lithe. They're very lithe <laughs> and svelte. They're lithe and words. svelte. Yeah, so. My number eight. <laughs> Is a very live, very svelte <laughs> game. This is a game that has, oh gosh, 18 cards, I want to say. Maybe fewer than that. Wow. 15 cards and a few coins. That's it. That's everything in the game. 
It's Svelte. <laughs> this is a game that Tom, at the very least, I don't know about Mike, but Tom despises. Oh, is it a party-ish type game? It's not a party-ish okay. type game. Oh, is it that dumb game? I... It's that dumb game, What's yes. the name of that? I can't think oh, of it. Oh, what if I show it to you and you try to pronounce it? You taught it to us live. I can't read your writing. Kobayakawa. Kobayakawa. Oh, okay. You taught us this on a live... My writing is a live show by one the way, time. Okay? That <laughs> well, is very this, svelte writing. This is not that much easier to read. Kobayakawa. <laughs> Kobayakawa. Small and capitals there. So this is a little bit like a... This is from uh, originally, by the way, Oink Games. Right. This is a bit like poker. In which you are... Oh, there's the only condition right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the idea here being you have a single card in your hand and you either then draw a new one and discard one of those two or you can flip over a card in the center, which is called the Kobayakawa, is that card in the middle. And then you, you put a coin in if you want to stay, kind of like you would in poker, for that hand. At the end of that round, anybody who is still in then is going to compare the card in their hand, and whoever has the highest card mm -hmm. is the winner of the round. That's it. Yeah, that's right. But the card in the center of the table that is face up and everyone sees, that total gets added on to whoever is still in and has the lowest number. And the dynamics that come from that are really interesting. Mm -hmm. So if the card in the center that's flipped over is, say, a 12, again, out of 15, Everybody who is staying in is racing towards the bottom. Because even at, at four, if I'm holding a four, I'm still beating your 15. Right. The best card at the table. But sometimes that card in the center is a very low card. And so, you know, you don't really want to stay in with a low card in hand. Every time I take this to a convention, and I'll tell you, I do it very frequently. I play this all the time at conventions. Mm -hmm. It is a smash hit. I have yet to play this with someone where... The group just ain't feeling it. Yeah. Everybody seems to get into it. It is fun. It is thinky. It's tiny. And it has kind of a small player window. It's like best at four. Mm. And you don't want to mess with that too much. The math goes a little funky on you. Yeah. But at that player count, I love it. It's always, always fun. Hmm. Kobayakawa, Tom is wrong. I, I really disagree on this one. I really don't like it. Huh. All right. Well, anyway, my number eight. You do like my number eight. Uh, we'll see about that. Why don't you say it first? Also a small game. Okay. It's a very small game that allows only one player to play at a time. You might almost never play this game. But it's quick enough and fast enough. And that game is Welcome to the Dungeon. Mm. A couple of yellow games in a row that are yeah, like, they, well, you know what? two oint games that are brought over because this was Dungeon Gosh, of Mandom. Right. This is Tom, this was copycat. Dungeon of Mandom <laughs> first. Yellow was definitely really trying to make wow, a lot of those games at this point. Time. I like Welcome Dungeon, or if you see Welcome Back to the Dungeon, they're essentially the same game with just different stuff in them. You are there's a each round you pick a one of these heroes, a mage, a warrior, whatever, to go through a dungeon. And then as a player, you are taking away one of that hero's piece of equipment, or you're adding a card to the dungeon, or you're out. Once everyone drops out except one person, that person has to go through that dungeon, flipping the cards over one at a time, and with the equipment that's there. Mm -hmm. And it's always usually by the skin of your teeth. Yeah. It's a push your luck game, and you're sitting there trying to think what everyone else played. You know, everything you take away means you're staying in the round, making it harder for you to go through. I really like it. It's a fast, little, fun game. It's so funny that two Oink games brought over by Yellow are both mm -hmm. on your same thing there. That's well, cool. I will tell you that Yellow, uh, I, I think Oink was a little stronger at this point. I, you know, if, if we're hey, missing... Yellow, take it easy. That's one of their good games. <laughs> yeah, back then we didn't have to justify liking yeah, we, their games. Yeah, games That's didn't true. need a soundtrack back <laughs> then, true, like, right? okay? They were just good on their own. Yeah, this was well before the days of Tomato Motto. Um, oh, let's not talk about that one. So, yeah, but I don't know. This, this was a really I clever like game. game. I like this, this game. This is an interesting central concept mm -hmm. that I'm surprised is not used in other things. This idea of... Kind of like this weird reverse betting, mm -hmm. like I'm going to stay in, right. and therefore I'm making myself weaker if I'm the winner. Yeah, Baccarino yeah. Weird... did it with a dungeon crawl little game, too. He did? Although I forget the name of his game, but yeah. Oh, but it's that idea of, oh, I can run up the hill. 
you know. Oh, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you were boasting or whatever, right? Yeah, about, it was a yeah. boasting thing. But I can run up this hill with a backpack on. I can run backwards with it. No, you're, no. you're like hobbling yourself more and more. It's a cool idea. Yeah, it's smart. It is. The only slight disadvantage of these games, like I said, is Mike could just every time be like, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, mm -hmm. I'm doing it. And he would lose, and I might win because Mike failed. You don't get to play, though. You yeah, don't get right. to You're play. still playing a little bit, but yeah, it's fun to go through the dungeon. Anyway, welcome to the dungeon. Number seven. My number seven is a game that is a variation of a classic card game, specifically Patience Solitaire, the Patience version of Solitaire. My number seven is the very first Kickstarter I ever backed, I believe. I believe. My number seven is SOS Titanic. So this is Bruno Catala and Ludovic Moblanc. This and was a Kickstarter? It was. It was like, I, if it was not the first, it was the second. Uh, the this or, or Dungeon this Roll. One? I don't remember. It's a Ludonaut uh, production. Mm. But this is essentially the patient's version of Solitaire with special powers. And they say it's a one or a two player game, or maybe you can even go to. Oh, yeah, it plays. Yeah, it's one. Cooperative. It's a solo game. It is solitaire. And it uses the Titanic as the theme, and the idea is that you have first class and second class passengers, and you have a certain number of lifeboats, and you are trying with those classic patience uh, solitaire rules to get those passengers manipulated in such a way that you can get them onto the lifeboats before the Titanic sinks. And it was one of the first times that it had a spiral bound book mm -hmm. that would represent every time you flipped over a page, it would be, you know, something bad happened. You have to reshuffle cards and more of the boat would sink and it would have the time. So it was getting ticking ever closer to finally, if you turned over the last page, you lost. If you didn't get very difficult game, first mm -hmm, of all, mm -hmm. it, was, you know, it was very difficult to, to uh, win. But this is a game I still have in my collection. When I'm in the mood to play Solitaire, I'll play this because it's Solitaire plus mm -hmm. with a little bit of spice. Um, still really like SOS Titanic. I just played this about a week ago. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Brought it out. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, let me try this. It's been years yeah, probably yeah. since I played. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's still fun. And I still love... This is silly because the game is clearly abstract. Yes. But I love the the cab the sort of sections of the ship yeah. sinking right as bad things you know as time time goes by and bad things happen you flip over that page and there's that new gorgeous illustration yes. of the ship sinking more in the time of night at which it yep. it would have been at that point with so the cabin going this? yeah like a week ago and this didn't make your list we don't know well sometimes sometimes playing something kind of retriggers how much you like it yeah yeah I like it it did not make my list okay. no but it would have been 11 or 12 or 13. Okay. It, was, it was a strong year. It really yeah. was. I could have made a top 20. I could have made a top <coughs> 25. I could have made a top 26. I can oh, name that okay, too. Okay, fine. I can't do that. My number seven is Freedom, the Underground Railroad. My favorite game from Academy Games. This one manages to do two things very, very well. It is incredibly respectful of the subject yes. matter and handles that with class. And it's a great cooperative game. 100%. That is dynamic and exciting and just a fun, good game. I really like this. And you know what? It's so different from so many co-op games. It really is. Because so many games follow that. We've mentioned already Pandemic, but so many games do have that Pandemic framework yeah. of do something good, do something bad, draw a couple cards, whatever. Like They, they follow a, a, a prescribed you know, a script. This one doesn't. This game really has its own vibe, mm -hmm. its own inner workings that feel different from other cooperative games. It really does. You know, it's incredibly challenging and difficult to do well in the game, but it is, again, it manages to do both. Be an educational tool and an interesting design. And just be a good game, a fun game. Yeah. So, yeah, Freedom of the Underground Railroad, if you're someone who enjoys cooperative games, you like exploring different cooperative games, and this is not one you've tried, I completely recommend it. It really holds up well. Mm -hmm. That's my number seven. Almost a crossover with you here. Yeah. I definitely considered putting this on the list. But I, this game, like you said, is very respectful. I'm going to pick a game that's slightly less respectful to a few of our listeners, and I apologize to the English. 
But my number seven is 1775 Rebellion mm -hmm. from the same company. And I wow. I considered both these, these games, the same actually. Year, huh? they, yeah. Oh, wow. man, this is... If you ever say, what's Academy's best year? Sure. It's 2013. No kidding. Yeah, that's two, two. Those never are played two best games, I think. <sighs> wow, really? I played. I haven't played this one. I played 1812. Very similar. Although this one has more of an area control feature than 1812. This is, I think... The best in the line, although Vikings is close. Mm -hmm. The one that has 878 different Vikings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> man, I like... I also... I'm very... I love this theme. Mm -hmm. I love talking about American independence. We kicked y'all out. This is 200 years ago. I had nothing... 246 years ago. Mm. I had nothing to do with any of it. Mm -hmm. But I, I like the theme a lot. It's very like, woo, pride. <laughs> and something that happened back. But it's also a very fun game. And this one... You know why I picked this over the yours, though? Mm. I, this one's a little more joyful to me. Yeah. Yes. I get that. This I also get has that. people dying and stuff, so I guess it's not that much, you know, if you think about it too carefully. Sure. But Underground is not a game I played lightly. Yeah, I'll yeah, play no, I it, get that. And I'll say, this is a good game. People are like, was it fun? And I'm almost afraid to say yes. Right. I get that. I get yeah, that. No, I understand that. Mm -hmm. I do think it's a fun game because, you know what, at the end of the day, it is a game. Mm -hmm. What it does is this very serious subject matter, sure. Right. And it handles it respectfully and well, but it's also a fun game, yeah, you know? It's a right. well-put-together, tense, exciting, oh my goodness, you know, can I do this? Can I achieve this? Right. Um, yeah, yeah, but I get what you're saying, absolutely. But if you're looking for Academy games, you don't know where to jump in. Those are the two best Those games. Those two, right there. They're, they're all good. I like Academy games, but these are their two best ones. Yeah. Number six. I strongly suspect that my number six will have at least one crossover, although I think it's going to be higher on the list. I will cross it off mine immediately. It's I don't not, think it's going to be with uh, you. I think it, I'm not sure what you think of this game. I think it's on my list. It's my number three. You may be right. I, th I think it could whatever, be that high Whatever, whatever I think of this game, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to myself. This is another historically themed game, although they're going Crap. for much less of the sim the simulation type of a feel and more for just the theme of it. My number six is Lewis and Clark: The Expedition. So this is a um, this is a race game essentially, um, but it's also a hand management game and. This was the first game that handled cards in this way that I played. I know it's not the first time that games have done this kind of hand management system, but it was the first time that I had been approached with it, where basically cards have the different strengths, and you have to pay for cards with other cards, yeah. and you're paying those strengths. And there's a worker placement aspect to it, there's a hand management aspect to it, but it really is mo it's all about that race, and the idea of where to set camp I thought was such an interesting idea too because that's not done very often where sometimes you have to back up. You know what I mean? You, right. Where you set camp is crucial because, you know, that can be the difference between winning and losing. Um, uh, the, the, the timing and tempo decisions that are in the game. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the how, when to burn cards when you know, hey, look, I'm not going to really need these types of cards anymore. Now I need to be getting mountain cards. How you do that, the special characters and their powers. Um, it's a really, really smart game. Uh, it's one that player count is an issue because I think it runs long. Yeah, very anything long. really more than two. Uh, to me, this is a one or two player game, but at that count, I love Lewis and Clark. My number six. This is probably my 11. Oh, wow. I really thought this be would be on your you. list. You used to like this more, I think. Yeah, I think so. I think there's too many other games that have done very, very similar things. Mm -hmm. Like Everdell yeah. is a worker placement and, and hand management right. stuff. And then Dune Imperium, I think, is very similar as well. Mm -hmm. We have, like, you can take a turn, which is a board turn yeah. or a hand turn. Right. And there's a lot of games like that. This one was one of the first ones to do that, and it did it very well. Yep. But yeah, I, I it, it's dropped a little bit. The okay. main thing I agree with, though, it scales terribly. It does. This is a two-player game. Mm -hmm. Even at three, I played once at three at a convention. I was so pissed. I like didn't play it for a long time after that. <laughs> well, that's. I mean, I don't like it, mm -hmm. but I don't think I played it with less than three. Mm. I also don't want to, though. I mean, I, I think it's a neat game, but wow, I did not like it. I was like, this is the slowest race ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that usually bothers me, but uh, yeah, this this one works at two. It works very well at one or two. My number six is a game I played with Tom a long time ago. Ooh. Again, it falls into that category of little-known games. And I wonder, Mike, if you've played this, because I know you'd like it. Okay. This is a French game. I'm already in. And it's got that whole, those things we like in French games. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Good mix of... Wait. Oui. 
We 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 like we, it. We. Yes, we us too. <laughs> okay. Wait. <laughs> this is a game called Origin. Oh, I. I did play this. You've played this one. But it, gosh, it was. It may have been like in 2013. Oh my word. This I forgot about this game. The different game. heights. Yeah, so it's got these characters. The game yes. is, is the theme Abstract. here is. One of the um, first Madigo games I played. Yeah, the theme here is. Yes, well, I history. Did play the this. history of the world and the expansion of peoples mm -hmm. from the cradle of civilization out to the rest of the world. Yes, it's very historical. But well, yes. that's the theme. Right, Again, right. that's the setting. And so you are expanding characters, and you're grabbing these different, Golly, almost totem-like figures game. and putting them out, but then also developing um, different technologies, which, mm -hmm. again, is all very, very abstracted. And these pieces are lovely, very large. They're really neat. Um, the whole thing is just very... Um, it's a smooth system. It's one of those, again, French-like games mm -hmm. that... You can take quick turns in it. You are expanding. Sometimes you want to make it to specific areas on the map because you have cards that score for that. Sometimes you're doing specific groupings. It bounces back and forth between, oh, I want to affect the board this way, mm -hmm. and I want to affect my hand this way, and they kind of feed off each other. I really enjoy it. It's a quick-playing, attractive game. From what I understand, and I can't... I don't think I've ever confirmed this. Bruno Catala developed, developed this heavily. I can see that. From what I understand, like, he was very involved. Mm. It's almost, from what I understand, again, what I've heard yeah, yeah. is that this is almost his game. Wow. You know, so, and that kind of checks out. It I feels like one of his games, Gosh, you know, I forgot all ways. about this. Yeah, I do like this game, but I only played it one time. I never owned a copy. Yeah. I played a friend's copy, and, and but I haven't played it since. It's fun. I yeah. really do enjoy it a lot. That All right, good. my number six is also quite abstract. In fact, it's a straight abstract. Okay. Uh, sequels to this game, well, only one sequel's come out. They they threatened it. No, they did two. Were um, they like different materials? The they sequels? were. Mm. This is the Duke. El Duco. This is a game, I gotta say, this was also originally a Kickstarter. This is the really? first year wow. that Kickstarters were coming out. I remember seeing this on Kickstarter oh, thinking... Wow. Ah, because what this game is, it's like chess, but your piece, how your piece moves is on it, and then after your piece moves, you flip it flip over it and it over. has a different movement. And I remember seeing it thinking, oh my word, that looks complicated. Because mm -hmm. it does look complicated. It does. But I'll tell you, once you start playing it, it is, first of all, you, you don't have that many pieces on the board at any given moment. Because right. you start with three pieces, and one of your actions can be to bring a piece out if you have a spot to put him, or move one. Well, you're not going to just keep bringing pieces off and your opponent just starts killing sure, them. Sure, sure. So there's a lot of movement and thought that goes into it. It is, it's tremendous. It is a really good, thinky game. Yeah. There's a lot of little expansions they built, which are all completely unnecessary. They're fine. They add some flavor to it, but the base game itself is, it's, it feels like a classic almost. I never played the Duke, but I played the latest one with Yarrow you. Yarrow or whatever? Yeah. No, you, no, no, no. Mike no. played the the newer one. Right. We played it, I think, as a paid playthrough. Yeah, for, yeah. It was a pr okay. prototype. And what was it? It was red and white. Yeah, I can't remember what it was called, but it was the same system. Did it have system. a, like, a Shogun type of setting? Was it a Japanese don't setting? Remember, I don't even remember, honestly. I mean, Someone tell us what we played. I remember, I remember it was fun because the theme the doesn't really matter that yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. But it was, yeah, it was the same system of tells you what the piece does, flip, flip it over. It. Yeah. Um, I never played any of the other ones. I like the Duke, though. It's been many years since I've played, but I agree with you. It's it's a really solid abstract game. Yeah. The sequel is the Jarl, which came out. The Jarl was good. But the Yarl is more about hand, very, very close combat. The Duke lets you do a lot more sliding pieces, yeah. which I really like. I like sliding across the board. It's, yes. it's fun in chess. If you like chess, I think you would like the Duke, honestly. Uh, yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, and it's almost, yeah. It's some, I think Jordan mentioned Onitama. That's kind of a, another... The Onitama and the Duke, I, I, I like Onitama better. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, there's definitely a category of these games, Onitama, the Duke. Right. Uh, the one from David Wilson um, with the chips. War chest. War chest. Oh, yeah. gotcha. Um, stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, that's the Duke, my number six. Number five. My number five is a little card game that was released in 2013 mm -hmm. in a 
very small printing, if I remember correctly. There we go. And then it got picked up by a, a more mainstream publisher, and it exploded. And this game has spawned a sequel that I think still gets played. My number five is a pure drafting game. Sushi Go, baby. Oh, sure, and I sure. had this edition right here. This was the first edition <laughs> I played. So, but this was Adventureland Games. This was David uh, or uh, Phil Walker Harding, right? It was his company, yeah, his I think. His, company, his brother's Adventure company. Adventureland Games, yeah, um, yeah. That was the version that I had. And I loved this. And I had this game. And I, everybody I could find, I was teaching it to. Whether they liked games or not. This was a game I could play with families, right? Grab, sit down. That's right. You're going to learn a game. This was, the, this was the game at the time that I was never scared of introducing to people. And I don't play games. All right, well, give me a five minutes. I can, you can play. And, and it went over like gangbusters every time. I... This was the this was the game that almost every time I taught it to somebody, they were like looking, okay, where can I buy this? Yeah, you know what I mean. Like th this game was huge when I first started playing it because I just I never got sick of it, and I still would play Sushi Go, you know. And Sushi Go Party, yeah, it's great. It makes it even more replayable. But I'll sit down right now and play a game of Sushi Go. Yeah, the original Sushi Go. I, I still think that it is a classic. I assume. That this is Phil Walker Harding's best-selling game. This game is everywhere. Probably like, I, you right. You can walk into like a Coles right now mm -hmm. and pick up a copy of Sushi Go. Probably. Yeah. I don't know how well his Spiel des Jahres nominated. Um, the the one with the, the Egyptian one. Yeah. Well, that I mean, um, in Germany that might have sold well. Maybe. But it you're bigger, right. Though. Definitely this is Sushi like, Go. This is an impulse buy. Yeah. Well, also you mentioned Game Right making Forbidden Desert a great value for yeah. its money. They also made Sushi Go Party. Which is another I still don't know how they make those games so cheap. It's great. It's great. Great yeah. quality and, 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 yeah. Decent quality. Well, for the money, Tom. I for mean, the money, it's, yeah. it's still only decent quality. Yeah. It's not great. Those cars get beat up. But yeah, yes. but it's like 10 bucks. Buy another one. <laughs> and another. That's right. Another one. It's a disposable game. Let's talk about great quality, guys. All right. Great quality. My number five uh, is the only game I've ever... No, that's not true. Thrown up on. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one of the very, very few games that I've ever owned that came with... Uh, one of the components was a napkin. Okay, well, I know what company it is. Is this a victory point game? It's a victory it's point game. Kudos to you both. But there's okay. only so many. There's, yeah. there's a lot of them. This is 2013, though. Okay, so this is going to be an early one. This is going to be that one that you like. The, it's not the, the chess one. No. This is a game that is in my top 100, but the second edition is yeah, in my Gem top Rush. 100. So the first edition yeah. of Gem Rush mm -hmm. came out in 2013. Which is, I, I found pictures right. for the first edition. Ah, that's what I did. That's what I do with By the Sushi way, if you flip Ooh. over that cover, it still says Gem Rush. <laughs> that's a bad cover, It barely though. says Gem Rush. Yep. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it came with a napkin because the pieces are laser uh, laser cut in, yep. in the Victory Point games, the original Victory Point game. You get pseudo. You have to yes. wipe. <laughs> you, they gave you a napkin to wipe the edges off of the counters. Yep. And they, that stuff got everywhere. It was awful. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I just let it come off naturally. I'm done playing and my hands were just black. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's you, not good. You needed to wipe those things mm -hmm. off. But yeah, in this game, you have these tiles. It's a card game mainly, but it's sort of an exploration game. You are managing a hand of cards. And then these tiles, you would reveal these, and if you had, say, on the left there, if I had a red, a black, and a yellow gem in my hand, I could play that, and my little character could move through that tunnel, score me two points, and then I would reveal a new card and lay it right there. Bam, opening up new places. They also have a little ability, which if you end on that tile, you can take that ability to replenish your hand, and they would change it up. You're racing to a certain number of points, or you could even play cooperatively, mm. where you were racing against the deck running out. You'd be burning cards from the deck. I prefer it co uh, competitively. I think it's a little bit better of a game. But both ways work, and the game is fun. It's a neat, quick, exploratory sort of thing. I love, you I've like always loved games. games in which you begin with a little area and you reveal new places. Mm -hmm. I just love that. I've, yeah. I always have. I love this idea of uh, the, I don't know what's just outside this area until I flip over a town. Like, oh, that that was there the whole time. Look at that. I love that stuff. So, Gem Rush is neat. This version was fine. <laughs> but version 2, and again, I, and I own this for a long time. I'm not saying this is, wouldn't have been my list without 2 existing. It absolutely would have. I just happen to now own the second edition 
and it's a much better production. The game is simply better now. But this was great. My number five is a couple years ago fell out of my top 100, but it was as far up at one point as in my top to actually it was my number one for a bit. Someday, okay, okay. In, a, in a few years or soon, I've, I've seen threats on Board Game Geek that they're making a third version of this. This is Duel of Ages oh. second edition, <laughs> yeah. which came out ten years ago. Ooh, what a looker! So Look at Duel that. Duel of Ages. Wait, wait, <laughs> wow. wait. So Duel of Ages second edition came out ten years ago. Yeah. Wow. Really? Because the Duel of Ages, the first one came out almost twenty years ago. It's one of the first games I reviewed. Wow. Yeah, Man. I played the first one. So if you've never heard of Duel of Ages, I don't blame you. This cover, I'm sure, is selling you on it. But you are playing various characters. You have a team of characters from past, present, future. Um, and Fantasy, science fiction, all sorts of things. Anything you think of, actual real characters. And you're running around on this gorgeous map <laughs> with the gorgeous pieces oh. and gorgeous cards. Okay, here's the thing, though. <laughs> Stop mocking my game, is my Mike! Man, is my man over here just a builder? <laughs> He's just a... It's, it's like just, a pirate mongoose it's just a and a builder. Plate. Yeah, that's... Um... <laughs> all right, but... Pecs on that cat. Okay. So, <laughs> literal cat. <laughs> so here's the thing, though. This game, it, you look at those cards, you can... There, there's millions of combinations. You have these characters that have, like, 15 are, stats Are those on their icons sites. on the right, Tom? They are. They're all the same. I mean, they're just different numbers, and the color <laughs> helps you remember if a number's good or not. They also have special abilities. So you have Attila the Hun running around with a bazooka <laughs> going up it. against that uh, minor big peck dude uh, <laughs> who happens to have a machine gun uh -huh. against, I don't know, Davy Crockett... <laughs> Who's with uh, a futuristic laser gun, you know? Sure, right, right. And exactly. you're running around and you're fighting each other, but you're also doing things like driving a spaceship, going bowling. Yeah. You're the, it's, it's strike three. It's bizarre stuff. It yeah, really yeah. is. And it sounds love that stuff. terrible, but it really does come together in a very, very fun way. It really does. I, I wish with all my heart that he would the guy who owns the, game, the company, would take this, work with other people, get good artwork, streamline lots of parts of the game because yeah. the, it's so much fun. It was my number one for a long time for a reason, the first edition, because it was so much fun. Number two, he doubled down on the complexity. I'm reading the diaries for number three, and he says he's streamlining it, but as I read these diaries, it seems like it's more of a sideways thing. It's not making it necessarily more complex, and it also doesn't look much better. And, oh, man, it's now, it, Duel of Ages 2 was made for fans of Duel of Ages. I wanted Duel of Ages 2 to be made for everyone. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, but it is so much fun. I like it. The anachronisms in it, yeah, Kabuki Kid says, I like that. Me and Z were just talking about that. That's a, yeah, something yeah. I like doing. Sure. I love having all these different people with different weapons. I love the, the comedy that I see in my head. Mm -hmm. The Bill and Ted movie, that's basically right, what right, it is. Right. I love that stuff. And I like the different combos. Like when you have someone with a, like, an, the, who's that sniper from World War I? Uh, what's the guy who's really good at sniping uh, World War I? Sorry. The I, Red Baron. I apologize for asking you. Uh, no, I'm, I'm seriously confused at who you're talking about. World War One or two? World War One. There was a guy in the in the Americans who was like a really really good sniper. He was one of the best snipers ever. Anyway, he's in this game. For, yeah, for some reason it's not ringing a bell to me. Okay. Here. Well, anyhow, but then giving him like a modern sniper right, rifle. Right, right, right. That sort of thing is just fun to see. Or you know, some new futuristic robot is chasing down right. Davy Crockett. Amelia and Earhart in a stealth bomber type of a thing. Yeah, I don't know if she's in the game, but. <laughs> <laughs> Beowulf's in the game, Braveheart's in the game. Yeah. There's just a lot of stuff, and I just like that combo. Again, I can see how the idea would be amazing. Yeah, just I, I don't push this on people. Right. I don't I don't sit there and go, you gotta play it because mm -hmm. I know the people like I think I could play this with Roy. Roy would have a good time. Yeah, yeah. Um I could play this with Joey and the rest of you all, I'd be like, I don't think you should play it. I've played. You have, but you did not love. Oh, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, to be fair, I played it once. Alvin York, that's his name. Thank you. Oh, Alvin Sergeant York. Alvin York. Oh. I, now I've really three He was about, the inspiration it, for Solid I mean, Snake. Alvin York was not somebody I spent a lot of time in class talking about. I'll just put it no? that way. No. Well, oh, man. You never heard of that, like, Lost in Yorker? Well, teaching about it's snipers. About Alvin. About teaching about snipers is probably not the best thing to York's do York's Peppermint Patty, I'm aware of. Sergeant York. That, yeah. he, he inspired that, too. Alvin, Simon, and Theodore, I'm aware of. Yeah. Number five, Dual Avengers 2. Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> Number four. 
troubled water. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> We're in the top four. Are we, are we to the top 100 yet? Not for you. You're a top two. Or no, top only my top two. So my number four is a game that was released in 2013, but probably came into most people's lives, lives a couple of years later when it was localized. Um, but to be fair, I did play this version in 2013. This is Mysterium, but the original. Oh, oh I remember that was so. Remember this? Yeah, like, it was so hot. It was to not dry. just me. Like this I'll do, was. Here, I'll do a little humble brag right now. Yeah. I'm fairly certain mm -hmm. that I had the first copy of this in the United States. I believe it. Because you... I know Ignacy right. gave it to me at Gen Con. Mm -hmm. Deal with that reality, Basil. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in awe. You're also Thank covering you. up your mic. Um, yeah, th th Thank so, you. so this I remember at the time <laughs> hearing this about cool. it. Yeah, it was so. This was a thing, right? When this came out. The buzz was there. Yes. The buzz was People would ask huge. you if you could... Well, you said it's the name of the game yet, Mike. No, I said Mysterium. I did it's say that. It's not called Mysterium. Yeah, well, there was this one. There was also, if you remember, maybe this year, maybe even a year after, there was an Italian edition. That, I remember that. So people were either trying Ooh, to get the Portal so edition boring. or the Italian edition before <laughs> it became localized into English. Because it's language independent, right? It's all about those cards and the, you know, I mean, I think most people are familiar with Mysterium at this point, but... Yeah, I was so excited about this. I paid, you know, to get it imported, and it was, you know, brought it to game groups and, you know, game nights, and, and it was very, very hot. You know, it was, for a while there in 2013, it was like yeah. the game. That heat worked against the game for me. Yeah? Because it was so big, I was like, oh, my word, blow me away, and then it didn't. Yeah. And I was like, really? oh. I still like Mysterium. I, I mean, it's not in my top 100 by any means, but. I thought this one was... This one was a lot moodier than when they printed Mysterium. I agree. Mysterium went kind of a little more cartoony, a it little more, more Scooby-Doo. Yes. Yeah, Mysterium went a little Scooby-Doo. This one felt like... Darker. A Polish... Mm -hmm. Gothic. Go yeah, Gothic Dixit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. It was like Dixit with a story about ghosts and murder. Mm -hmm. And you could tell that, that was, it was creepy a it little was. bit. Yeah, you know? yeah. It really it worked, I thought. Mm -hmm. And they Disneyfied it a little bit. Right. They, they changed up some rules. They, they made it a little more you know, uh, gamer-friendly or approachable. But no, this is a good call. Yeah. Gosh, I haven't thought of this edition of this in ages. I first has a little Super Chat 5, if I can pronounce it correctly. That's not happening, Tom. Yeah, I just give it up. Sayanichi Domastu. I'll give you five dollars to never do that again. <laughs> okay, how about that? Where's my wallet? <laughs> That's my number four, Mysterious. That's worth a try. My <laughs> number four is, I suspect, will be on somebody else's list. It's got to be. It's still a huge game. Number four is Viticulture for me. What is this? Viticulture. It's this little game about winemaking. Mm, not familiar. You might not have heard of it. It's uh, in the Scythe universe. Uh, <laughs> way in the back. Where's the neck? neck somewhere behind right, the yeah, mountain? Yeah. It's behind the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Viticulture here, of course, is one of the uh, Stonemeyer games. Uh, one of the, I don't know if this is one of the earlier ones, but it's, it's yeah, it I guess. Is. He doesn't have that many games, is the thing. Yeah. So when you say one of the earlier ones, I guess it's one of the early this ones. This was his Euphoria. first game, wasn't it? Was it the yeah, original one? Yeah, I think this, yeah. and then Euphoria came after. Euphoria was after yeah, this, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yes, it was one of the early ones. And, um, yeah, it's just sort of an optimization puzzle kind of game in which you are growing these grapes, harvesting them, making wine, selling that wine, managing mm -hmm. a lot of things. The game is interesting. Now, again, this is one that I think a lot of people have played. Mm -hmm. uh, I got three bucks for trying. <laughs> yes. Yes. You got three dollars. All Seems right, good there you degrees. go. A creative Nico five for up. trying Thank to you. pronounce. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got eight bucks. There you go. All right, instead of five, you got eight bucks. That's great. This is like, not, not like my childhood. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> this one, um, I do enjoy. I like the theme. I like the setting a lot. Mm -hmm. I think it's cool. It's a very, it's a cool pastoral sort of theme. You know, it puts Pastoral. you there. It does. puts you there. It's, an, it's neat. It it's does. a little crunchy, but not too punishing on the brain. No. I like all of that. I like the way this all works together. I think a lot of people, and in fact, this has happened in the comments already quite a bit, that folks are mentioning, oh, Viticulture. Oh, but I, but I played the Essential one. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people have come into Viticulture with the Essential one. But the original one, this, well, the one with the Grande Worker. Right. Was a solid game. Right. Yeah. Out, you know, it we, was. we played that. You and I played this. Mm -hmm. 
And I remember us actually playing it multiple times on that table at your old place, being like, this is good, let's try that again. Mm -hmm. This was definitely a game that when I first played, I gave it a six. Hmm. I now give it a 10. Yeah. That Grande worker changed it oh, that much. It's huge. Yeah, yeah and it the really expansions, is. again, assuming you want to include them, they've really helped as well. Some sure. of those. All right, my number four is about choo choo trains, and that is Russian railroads. Oh, oh, this is very. This is also in your top 100, right? I didn't realize this the first 2013. One. My top four are all in my top 100. Hmm. Well, Viticulture, you rate a 10, but it's not in your top 100? Garbage. So nice, Tom. Good Russian, job. Russian Railroads is a worker placement game, and there's lots of different spots you can see on the board that you place these workers on, and it, they're so mm. important that you want to go first. But most of these, what they're doing is they're letting you build tracks on your own little player board. Each person has their own player board that has four lines, and you're moving these kind of pieces that represent track on each of these lines. And then at the end of a turn, depending on what you've moved down on which of your lines this, this board here shows you, you have uh, the different lines, and also there's a bonus marker you're moving. It's just a bunch of tracks, and you get points. But knowing which tracks to move, the bottom one can get you a ton of bonus points, but the top one can just give you straight points. It's really interesting, but it is definitely a thinky-esque game. It's also not particularly a looker, although I have not yet seen... I, I, I don't have the, uh, they made like a big Ultimate made an Railroads, ultimate edition, yeah. which I never did get a hold of. I don't know how confusing that would be, because they made, later on they made the stupidly named expansion. What is Russian it? Russian Railroads, German Railroads. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting too, because in Russian Railroads, 2013 is a pretty common final score you get too, so... Mm -hmm. This is a game where you score... Your score is ridiculous. Ridiculous, I yeah. I'm not a fan. Of games that have really, really high scores. I think the only game I'm okay with that in is like you're bluffing or something. <laughs> well, I'm gonna argue that we are okay with that. You <laughs> watch your reviews this weekend. That's true. I'm a big fan of that because it yeah. makes me feel good. I'm like yeah, 212 yeah. points. Woo! Yeah. Yeah, it works for some games for sure. It works for me more often now. I don't like when you add zeros unnecessarily. Yeah. That's different. But just having a big score, I love that. I'm not when it, when the, our final scores are seven, six, three. I'm like. I don't nah. like that either. Though. Yeah, yeah. I don't like that either. I guess there is a sweet spot yeah, for there me. Is. It's around the 60s. <laughs> it's true. I'm yeah. sorry. It's true. That's where I want a game to be. Mm -hmm. It's like 72 points to 59. I'm okay with that. Yeah. That's amazing. That, that, that's a good poll question. That I should is. put that up in the YouTube thing. Yeah. Like, what range of score makes you satisfy yeah, you the most? I like yeah. that. All right. Number three. My number three is a crossover with Z Garcia. That is correct. And um, again, we talked quite a bit about this, so I won't go too much more into it, but it's Freedom the Underground Railroad. Uh, this is a game that, uh, you know, the, the, the big thing, like you said, is that it handles this very, very, to put it lightly, delicate theme um, in an extremely respectful way. Mm -hmm. Uh, even with that, I can understand why there'd be some people would never want to try it. I, I, I totally get that. But if you are in a place where you can, you know, give this a shot, understanding that they are handling it in a very, very respectful way, it is such a fantastic cooperative game where if anything's going to make you want to pull together... You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, there's yeah. weight to these decisions, but it's still a, like you said, you still feel the sense of, you know, fun. I mean, there's still a, yeah, it's a still way. it's still a game, right. It's still a game, and it's still a very, very mechanically sound game. So, again, we've talked about this a lot, but, but this is a game that I not only respect for how they handled a very difficult subject matter, but I respect as a design, too. Just mm -hmm. a really solid, cooperative game. So... Uh, Freedom the yeah. Underground Railroad, just a fantastic, fantastic achievement. Yeah, and it's good to have games like this that deal with these kinds of subject matters and are not just educational. Right, no, I agree. That are like not interesting to play. Mm -hmm. That I'm like, well, I'd rather read a book, honestly. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. want to play your your little game that is not much of a game. You're just really yeah, someone teaching. Someone just has that. It handles it respectfully, but is it actually a good game? And it's, oh, uh, yes. very much. Very yeah, much. Yeah, There's right. lots of terrible games with good things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. This is a very good game. Yes. Yeah. All right, my number three here is, um, gosh, I don't know why I ended up with a lot of these games that don't seem to get a lot of love, but I really enjoy. This is one of those games from Days of Wonder that is definitely not considered one of their hits. Could this, did this, 
Is it an exploration themed game? Yeah. This came out in 2013? Yeah. Interesting. That long. Wow. Yeah, I thought yeah. this was newer than that. No, <laughs> because it's 10 years old now. Yeah. That's because we played this cool stuff. This is Relic Runners. Yeah. So Relic Runners, yeah, it came out back in 2013. Wow. In fact, I thought a little while ago when you were talking about a really nice production yeah. that now would just be a normal production. I was like, oh, here we go. Oh, okay. Mike's going to be talking about Relic Runners. Because it's that same thing. You yeah. know, it's it's a very lovely looking game. Mm -hmm. These great plastic sculpts. It's just really neat stuff. Uh, there you go, those. That now would just be pretty um, standard pieces, you know. Yeah. Not, not unlocked in the Kickstarter or anything. Just pretty standard. But... Back when this came out, I thought it was absolutely lovely. And in the game, you are laying down paths in this jungle, moving around the jungle, collecting goodies at these different places you're exploring. And then eventually, once you empty a place of possible you know, things you can collect, you put out one of these little relics. And later on, if you can make a run from one relic in a single turn, boom, 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 to another relic of the same type, then you collect one. Mm -hmm. And they'll be worth a bunch of points as you collect them. This is a game that has a lot more going on in it than you think. I think that may be what worked against it. I this think was so heavier too. than most Days of Wonder games. Yeah, people seem to think like, oh, Days of Wonder only made really light games until mm -hmm. Five Tribes. No. I beg to differ. I yeah. think Relic Runners, while not a heavy game, mm -hmm. is thinkier than I think a lot of people remember it to be. I agree. This is not Ticket to Ride. Mm -mm. There's a lot going on. You have powers you level up and then unlock and reset. Yep. And different things you need to manipulate and consider. And There's plenty going on in this game. This is one of Matthew Dunson's first designs, isn't yeah. it? Right. Yeah. Yeah, this and Elysium right. kind of came out That's back right. to back. And for me, anyway, definitely put him on the map. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, this is a guy... To watch out for mm -hmm. these two distinct games that are very you know much their own thing and both are great games so yeah relic runners i love it i still got my copy i don't think this is one i'd ever get rid of i just love it but number three is if you ask me and or roy is in our top 10 please reprint this game and that is battle lore second edition mm. oh, battle yeah. lore second edition which was one of those times where it kind of really, no, I don't know anybody who plays the first edition. First edition was a fine game, came out from Days of Wonder with the promise of monsters. There was like a dragon at the beginning, and then they just kept making historical things, which is fine. Yeah. But if you promise me monsters, I want my monsters. Mm -hmm. Battle Lord Second Edition brought those monsters, brought a really great, one of the best things about this game is its setup. Because you can set up your pieces almost anywhere you want. You just put cards all over the board with a lot of bluff cards. Mm -hmm. So you and your opponent can set up simultaneously. And you don't know where your stuff is. You turn over the cards and boom, there are the armies. I really like that. Mm. And then you just get to fight with these monsters. That's fun. Um, there's, they came out with two factions. They added an undead faction. They added some reinforcements for both of them. And then nothing else. Wow. Because they wanted to push their um, Rune, Wars. Rune Wars game. Which... Fell apart and piece of trash and thanks for ruining Battle Lore, Rune Wars. <laughs> Hate you. Wow. Dumb, stupid game. Uh, anyway, so Battle Lore, second edition. Mm. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Ignore my hate. Jeez. Hate. Number two. My number two is a. I would say almost entry level pick up and deliver game. I love this theme. It's an un <laughs> no, 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 I love I the theme. Going, I mean, let me let me interrupt you for one yeah. second because I was going through the 2013 games. Yeah, yeah. As soon as I came across them, like here we go, Mike. There we go, time, baby. That's right. This is uh, a, a theme I love. It's a mechanism I love. This is Cinque Terre, the five villages. Yes, baby. Tom There's and I have so already many had this amazing discussion. games that came out in 2013, I love this. and you're putting this I as love top in my top so 100. Much. Yes, this is one of the two games in my top 100. This game is fantastic. You if just you put like this ahead of Vinicus. I haven't. No, that was on Z's list. Oh, was on Z's list. To be fair, I also put this ahead of Vinicus. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Okay, mm -hmm. this is my number zero. 
That's this game is a lovely, play. lovely pick up and deliver game where you are traveling to these villages in Italy and you are gathering produce, fruits and fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. with varying market, you know, varying values in the markets that represented by the dice. And it's got a little bit of the ticket to ride feel of where you're kind of going for the cards that are representing these things. You're turning those cards in to get the produce and then you're trying to sell them at the highest value. It's got a little bit of um, something that's overused right now, which is basically contract fulfillment, but it wasn't overused when this came out. Chris Handy invented it. Basically, that's kind of, you know, Chris Handy does Thank that Thank you, Chris stuff. Handy. Um, also, uh, I appreciate your deep thoughts. And that's Jack that's, Handy. That's, yeah. But Cinque Terre is a game that I absolutely love. I know that it's not universally adored, or else it would still be in print. No, but you I have like, a lot of like cult it. following. Every time you mention this game, they all come out of the woodwork. They're like, yeah! Yeah. Then I'm like, then check it out in my library. Then check Come it out. On. I'm happy to, I'm anytime, I'm happy to play it. And I do play it in our convention. Is it in the Dice Tower Library? I don't know if it is. No, it's not. I need to. I had to bring mine one time. Tom. That's why I had to bring mine. I gave him false hope. That was a Yeah, that was yeah, a yeah. That was a I I don't understand why people find that game ugly. I, I don't see how you can find that game ugly. I think I have a pretty decent eye for something that's, you know, generally. You think it's attractive? I do. I think it's a very beautiful game. I don't know if I would call it... The cover's not the best, but the board is beautiful. Okay, the cards are it. beautiful. I haven't seen the board up close. The cover is fine. It's okay, yeah, The yeah, board yeah. is also... It's beautiful. It's lovely. Where well, are you what getting do you want? beautiful? What more do you want? That yellow orange stuff is gaudy. It looks like a circus tent. It's citrus, Tom. You live in South Florida and you're saying that that's gaudy? Come on, we're surrounded oh, by oh, that oh, stuff no, here. No, no, look, I know gaudy because I am gaudy, okay? Well, I think it's pretty. You don't have to like it. I mean, no one has to like it. I like it. There You're the one who keeps debating it. I think it's beautiful. I agree with you. Hey, that's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. <laughs> Tom, I'll give you $5 if you pronounce this game. <laughs> Cinqua oh, Terre. That's like a you knife in my $3. heart. You owe me $3. A knife in my heart. Beautiful Jeez. game. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> I need to play this game so I can put it on lists. And I can say, Cinque Terre. There we go. All right, but I haven't played it. That's the spirit that I like. You'll my like number it. two is my favorite, I think. Stefan Feld game, which came out this year. And it is... Bruga. <laughs> That's how I say it anyway, okay? You can say it however you want to. Mm -hmm. Bruges is, um, has, I said at the beginning of the game, of the list here when I was talking about Kashgar, characters with powers. Mm -hmm. Whoo boy. Yeah, he, Feld went nuts with the characters with powers in this one. There's yeah. a big old stack of cards in this game. And every character, if I'm not mistaken, has not just unique artwork, but a different power. Yeah. They all have unique powers in this game, and I really like that. I love this idea of, at the beginning of the game, I've got my hand of cards, and I look at it all, and I go, okay, here's what I'm going to try to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to employ this guy. He's going to make it easier for me to use red workers to whatever, whatever. And so I just have to make sure that I have a good influx of red workers. Ooh, this guy's good with that. I'm going to employ him. And you start building your little engine, your little combos as you are doing all of that. Trying to get a few points here and there, but just run your little machine as effectively as you can. I really like that. I always have. I enjoy those kinds of games. And Bruges is a good mix between that and then really robust, tried and true point engine stuff. Feld stuff. What he's normally good at. Where you're getting, you know, this thing, four points, da 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 da, whatever six points all of that stuff with a layer of fun that a lot of his games don't have honestly i agree you know because they're missing that personality that that ooh combos and so this one sings to me it gives me the best of both of those worlds bruges is just fun i taught this to you this year this I, year I was yeah, say, last this, year yeah. this might have made my list if i had Oh, I've only played it once mm -hmm. when you talked to me this year, so I didn't feel like I had played it enough I'll to play it. play the new one. No, it looks like trash. But this I really enjoyed. I mean, I agree with you. This this is one of my favorite Felds. Uh, yeah. It's definitely in the top three for me for of his games. So, yeah, there you go. Bruges, the original good mm -hmm. 2013 printing of this. All right, my number two is, if I might be a bit of a spoiler, our only, as far as I can tell, three-way crossover oh, my. here. And that would be... 
viticulture. Mm. And again, this is kind of weird because this is not on my list from 2013 because I didn't think it was that great of a game. I thought it was okay at best. But then when they changed that rule and then added the expansion, it busted the door down. Mm, so much yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. This is my version to play right here. The one mm -hmm. in this picture. Oh, no, that's only the two seasons, right? Yeah. Never mind. That's just essential. Oh, you like the four seasons? I do like the, four seasons, yeah, both yeah. the hotel, the restaurant, and the game. <laughs> um, but I also like all the other stuff that's added. You can see some of it's added here in this picture. Great game. I know nothing. And you, get, Mike can confirm this. Nothing about wine. No. Like, less than nothing about wine. No. You know it's a liquid. Yeah, that's true. You got to give yourself some credit. 2%. If you give me a milk. wine that's test, two percent. No, it's, not, it's more than two percent liquid. It's 100%. I'm back to zero. What <laughs> about wine? Anyway, super fun game, but we'll talk about that in a moment. And finally, number one. My number one has been ruined. It's Duel of Ages 2. <laughs> there you go. It's that cover that did it. That's right. No, my number one is Viticulture, of course. But but like you, this is almost a little bit of a cheat because the, the Essential Edition is the way to play it. But this is when Viticulture was released. And, and, and this is something actually that we have talked about and thought about. Whenever we do a top 10 at the end of a year, yeah. we're like, let's do the actual year. I don't right. care what Board Game Geek says. Sure. When we go back 10 years, I can't remember. No, exactly. So now right. we're going by Board Game Geek. So it's always possible that we'll have a game on this list this year that actually came out in 2014 sure, or 2012. Sure. Exactly. But BGG changed the date to its whatever. Right. And so that's that's where we're going with And that's kind of what happened we with Mysterium. But at least in that case, I did play that early edition. I don't remember the first year I played Viticulture. I, I want to say that the first time I played it, it had the Grande rule. So I had a probably a better first uh, impression than you did. Uh, but I liked it from the get-go. And then when you add in, you know, the, the Tuscany stuff, that's even, you know, beyond. But this is still even just... Viticulture with the Grande Worker, especially Essential Edition, is uh, my favorite game of the year. And in my top, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was, this, you know, but it was it's high in my list. High on my list of best games of all time. Um, lovely theme, lovely uh, pastoral feel, like you said. Yeah, I, I really, really enjoy Viticulture. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it's one that, that I continue to play. This is actually one that I still play regularly. Um, and that doesn't always happen. Even on games I really like, this one I find sure. easy to get out and, and play. Yeah, I don't have some to, games you spend respect 40 minutes. And some games you play, right? Right, this is one I play and respect. Like Cinque Terre. A Cinque you play, Terre. but you don't respect it. I don't respect it. it. Now that Tom has called it uh, gaudy, yeah. Oh, my word. If anybody at this, uh, in the city, let's say, knows gaudy, vassal, mm. it's gaudy. No, no, no. There's, you. <laughs> you drive back and forth to work. I am not the most gaudy person in this not. city. Right, you fine. are not. <laughs> fine, fine. I'm, I'm very mild compared you're, to you're not even I'll the, give you that. You're not even the top 10th percentile <laughs> at all. But viticulture, lovely game. Obviously, all three of us put it on our list. That's the only three-way crossover, yeah. then. Unless both of our number ones are a match, yeah. and we're on Mike's list. Right. All right, so my number one is a two-player only nope. game. <laughs> this is a uh, <laughs> this is a follow up to another game I very much enjoy, and this one came out kind of reworked it, reprinted it, slash reworked it. This is the year that Asante I came out. I thought that's what you were talking which about. Which is okay. a follow up to Jumbo, a two player Cosmos two player line game, mm -hmm. and uh, Asante here, of course, same deal. It was a follow up to that, still a two player game. In fact, you could combine them, mix things in, but both of them certainly stand on their own. And this one, uh, it's an economic two-player game in which you are playing cards, those cards you see there in the center with the salt, the pelt, and the tea, I think it is. You can play those cards to buy those things for the small value in the bottom left-hand corner. And you get those goodies and put them out in your little board. You know, you have a stand, your market stand. You can later on then play a card very similar to it to sell those things if you have the right combination and you make the large amount of money. And that's the main idea of what you're doing. You are making money. You are racing to, I think, 60 gold. But along the way, you can also then play animal cards to mess with your opponent, play people cards to help you somehow. And you can even, there's a category of card that stays out on the table and gives you repeatable actions. 
Items, right? Mm. I think they're items, yeah. And so you can utilize those on your turn. You can spend an action to utilize that, and it'll do something. There's a lot of interesting cards in this game. Are the meerkats a good card? Because I just would want to play the meerkats. The meerkats so. are one of the best cards in the game. The only card better is the donkey. If there was a donkey <laughs> card, it would be better. I don't think there's such it a thing. It might be. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Could be. Um, so yeah, Asante is just a wonderful two-player game. It feels very different from a lot of two-player games. Yeah. It's... The economic bend to it is really kind of what makes it a little bit different. And it's, and it's very in your face. It's not that you're doing your thing and I'm doing my thing being economic. Not at all. I'm, I'm messing with your stuff. You're doing it back. But then under all that, there's this engine of mm. churning money as quickly as you can. That's how you win. And I really enjoy that. Those two things meet together in the middle very well. That's my number one. My number one... It's not a surprise, but I'm surprised it's not like it didn't make your top tens for either of you. Because I know really? you'd like it okay, at least. Well, like, okay. okay. It's the biggest game to come out this year. Viticulture is a bigger one in the long run, but this game, the sequel to Agricola, Caverna. Yeah, no, one. no, no. I know you like Caverna. You know, I do like it. I do like it. I think it I ran it a seven. Yeah, yeah. Say. yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. I love it. Also, I am not. Hitting the best covers of all time list with my, with my, true, with my games on this list. And th the thing is, if you look at this, this looks unbelievably overwhelming. Right. And it's really not. I can teach this. I just taught it to my kids fairly easily because you just are taking stuff. It's all about taking stuff. Take some It's just some there's fields. so much out there at the beginning of the game. It just seems... Right. Know. Well, it also, remember, only one card. It yeah. does, uh, that's a clever thing that not many games do. Oh, they I add agree. an action space I every agree. turn. Yeah, yeah, you gotta, that, that keeps it from being overwhelming. It does, yes. Okay, let me give you new options each turn, not mm -hmm. all in ones at the beginning of the game. I agree. Right. Yeah, this is good. This would be top 15 for me. Yeah, I think so, too. I think sure. for me, I got 11, I think, would be uh, Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. Maybe 12 SOS Titanic, mm -hmm. but this is in there. 13, yeah. 14, 15, yeah, it's in there. Yeah. I really like this. I don't, several people have mentioned Glass Road. Glass Road just was not nearly as interesting to me. It's one of his smaller games, Rosenberg. Yeah, I like, I like Glass Road. Uh, probably this better, but yeah. Let's take a look at what the people said here, Ooh. because I need to tell everyone people's choice number one so you, everyone gets off our backs. Mm-hmm. Okay. Here we go. People's Let's take a look. Right, what was your choice here? Number 10, Russian Railroad. Okay. okay. Tom, you have a point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Number nine. Concept. Concept is a good one. That is I a good love game. this one. It's, yeah. it's, it's barely a game, right? right it's more right. of an activity, but it's a really fun one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eight. Bang the dice game. Okay, yeah, that's a good yeah, one. It's, it's not banned from being said here. No, it's you can fine. just imagine it's an honorary mention. Sure. Okay. Number seven. Anima Anima Koji. Koji. I like it's this one. It's a good two-player game. It really is. Mm -hmm. It's people choices and feel that's a nostalgia. There Six you go. Caverna, which I think is different than in 2013, I think this would have been in the top three, but oh, time sure. has gone oh, by. Sure. Yes. This was huge. Number five. Eldritch Harbor. Yeah. Sure. That, I like Eldritch Harbor, but it just dropped yeah, a no, lot I for am. me. That's why it's not on my list. Number four. Forbidden Desert. Point for you. It holds and me. up. This holds up. It's for me, Point Michael. for you. Uh, I had it higher. Me. Thank you. I don't you. care. But he said, Thank I you. got the point. I said it louder. <laughs> Thank you. Number three. Vidiculture. Mine. Go. And number two. Sushi, Sushi Go. Goes. Do you know what number one is? It's by far, I, I'm not surprised on this. It's very much a people's choice. It's definitely my number 11, actually. I'm not kidding on that. I like it a lot. It just didn't make the list. It's probably not on my list, then. I don't know. It's, it's probably most critically acclaimed. It has a terrible cover, although what seems to be the, the yeah. 2013. It is Concordia. Oh, yeah. I thought this was 2014 for some reason. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Again, Concordia. maybe for you it was, yeah, yeah. right? But it definitely came this out in 2013. This was not the original cover. This is already the fancy this cover. This is already the other You're right. The You're original right. cover was rough. So <laughs> when I look good. back at what... So actually, let me tell you what the People's Choice was in 2013. You okay. have that data? Yeah. Oh, hit me with it one time. Number 10, yeah. Dungeon Roll. This was a little game Gone. that... Um, yeah, I, that was... I, Tasty I, I, Minstrel made like... Pallets of them. Remember I was saying Kickstarter, that was either my one or two, and SOS was the oh, other one. Oh, really? Yep. It's a terrible little game. Number awful, nine, awful. back when Feld was popular, Bora Bora. Okay. Mm. Number eight, Spirium. Remember playing that, that way, man? That's a game. Game. Starry Games. That was not a bad one. Number in seven. In between the two things. Yeah, you're playing between the things. Yeah. 
Francis Drake, number seven. Okay. Number six was Eldritch Horror. Okay. I was wrong about Caverna. It's number five. Okay. Number four, Space Cadets Dice Duel. Oh, Which man. had the fastest fall in history because I actually like it a lot. And the next year, they released Captain Sonar. Yeah. Which just straight up killed this game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number three, Bruges. Number two, uh, remember these are fans of the Dice Tower, right. and therefore uh, nothing personal. <laughs> was number two. Ah. Nothing personal, okay. And number one, Forbidden Desert. There you go. Yeah. Uh, for me, games that dropped out, number 10 was City of Iron. Okay. I like that a lot. Game. Yeah, that, that yeah. dropped a bit. Yeah. Nine, Carnival Zombie. I still have not played the updated one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Eight, Police Precinct. I was a big fan of that cooperative you were, game for a you while. Were, you, you were one of the few people game. who was all about that yeah. game. Six space six was space uh, seven was French Drake six space cadets dice still I liked it a lot mm -hmm. five Kemet and th this is one of those ones that I think for me was an actual 2013 I was gonna say and that on BGG on it's probably 12 or 14 okay got it I got but it. at the time that's when I played it four BattleCon three Dual of Ages two. Two, this one dropped for me a lot level seven Omega Protocol oh wow um, this is the second or the first one the second. This is second, the one I remember the first being not good. It was not. Straight it was, up not good. That was level seven. No, escape Omega Protocol or something like. No, level seven escape. It was about That's us the being first one and it's some not weird good. cooperative game mm. where we're just trying to escape. This the one second is one, was one like versus guns all. Blazing, right. cool game. Yeah, this is good. And then my number one, still as it was then, was Caverna, the Cave Farmers. Mm -hmm. Also, big games we didn't mention. Um, Eric's number one back then was Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. That's when that came out. I played that when it first came out, but I. I'm tired of that quickly. Crossmaster Arena came out that year. Yeah, oh my okay. gosh. That was very, popular for a while. The very, very forgotten Trains and Stations, the little dice game from That's Eric Lang. The Eric Lang game. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. A big game that came out this year, Firefly, came out 10 years Firefly ago. Firefly was 2013, huh? It was yeah. horrid. Oh, uh, I liked it for the first few plays. I like it, it's just I long. I it for the first few minutes. I think it's been killed by Outer, outer Rim, Rim by yeah, far. Sure. Outer Rim punched a hole in its thorax. Well, no, I, mean, I, would not, I would not argue that. Yeah. Ah. All right, folks. That's it. We're not done with live stuff, though. Come back no. tomorrow. What are we playing tomorrow? Today, tomorrow, we are playing Forsaken. Mm. As at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, we're going to be doing a live play of Forsaken. I'm going to forsake Z. I will besmirch you. <gasps> How about that? Are these things in the game? I'm about to write your name on an ostracon. I'm going to write your name in the Book of Death. Hmm? I'm going to write your name in the Book of Death. The Book of Death? Like the Egyptian like Book of the Dead? Is that what we're talking about? No, because that will bring you back to life. I don't want yeah, to baby, life. I'm coming back. I've been ah. tricked. <laughs> All right, we'll see you then. But until then, I'm Tom Basil. I'm Mike Delicio. I'm Z Garcia. Thanks for joining us 10 years in the past.